Um, you can find full bios of, every, of everyone here in, in your programs already, um, but let me just say um, that it's wonderful to have people back at Radcliffe. Uh, I think it's wonderful to have people come back home and to think of this as a home base, and again, I don't oh, the puns, the, the bad cliches will come flying when you start talking about sports, but uh, it's, it's, it's real too, and we are happy to have you back, and thank you so much. Martha was a Radcliffe Fellow in, in 09. You know, she teaches at Holy, Holyoke College, and she is the author of Curveball, the uh, biography of, of Tony Stone. Uh, Lydia, wow, um, Lydia is um, also a Radcliffe Fellow. Um, she's uh, an award-winning playwright, um, and I think her work speaks for itself. Obviously, many, of her, her, many of her plays explore race and gender on different levels, and uh, she's known here at the Huntington, uh, the Goodman uh, in Chicago, and her plays have been across the country. Megan, thank you so much for joining us as well, is an accomplished theater director with many credits to her name. Uh, she's worked with Lydia on several other projects, and I think that synchronicity was really helpful to, uh, in this process. Um, and she also works and consults with arts organizations to improve, to improve diversity and inclusion. Um, and Nambi Kelly is our Tony this evening. Um, She has many TV credits and stage credits to her name, and I think it's also important to point out that you're also a playwright, right? And that you're working on an adaptation of Toni Morrison's uh, Jazz. So uh, we have quite an, a distinguished group here with us, and uh, I kind of just wanted to start off by asking you all, I was trying to find some, some uh, commonality here that we could begin around sort of telling the story of, of Tony Stone and this idea of storytelling. And each of you tell stories in different ways um, as an actress, as a historian, as a playwright, and as a director, uh, staging the stories as well. And I kind of wanted to think of this as um, something to sort of reflect on how you go through that process, uh, how you sort of discovered Tony Stone, maybe starting with you, Martha, from the historical point of view, um, getting a sense of how you realized that you had a historical story to tell that was important to you and would be important to others? Um, well, I just first wanted to say it's grand to be back, uh, Dean Cohen, Judy. Um, I wrote uh, Curveball here, so it feels very, um, very wonderful to acknowledge that, uh, the support I got and the gratitude I feel um, for this wonderful place. Um, I, I, uh, I knew I wanted to, I'd finished one book, I, I knew I wanted to write a, a sports book because I love sports. I think it's a great um, lens for telling multiple kinds of stories. And I just heard this, I had heard this tag of, of the woman who replaced Hank Aaron. And that's all I knew about Tony Stone. And so I did some uh, basic research and it had to, uh, to write a book, I felt that it had to meet um, kind of three criteria, three rings of the story. First, was it a good, compelling, a story about baseball? Was there a narrative arc? Was there uh, enough drama to it? And I thought certainly there was that. Um, the second ring was more complicated. David Halberstam, the great nonfiction writer, once said, behind every great sports story is the story of a nation. Mm -hmm. And I think that's quite right if you think Muhammad Ali, Jackie Robinson, Billie Jean King. And so I think Tony's stories provides that kind of uh, look at uh, the period post-war, before the uh, major events of the civil rights movement, to look at Jim Crow America uh, through, um, obviously, the lens of gender. What was it like for a woman who had uh, this notion of doing something that was not supported by the culture, uh, that was sabotaged by some members of her own team? And then lastly, I felt it had to say something about who we are as human beings. And um, I didn't know the answer to that. And it took uh, a lot of uh, interviewing former players, old guys in garages and their basements telling me the story um, to find out what that might be. And I, I uh, met this one guy who played with Tony. His name was G uh, Thomas. Tater Buster Burt. <laughs> and uh, he, uh, we had an interview, the interview was winding up, and um, 
I asked him what he was doing now, and he said he was teaching his grandkids, um, coaching them Little League Baseball. I said, what's the hardest thing for them to do? He said, hit a curveball. And I did not know exactly what he meant. I played softball, but I didn't, I don't know the strategy of it. So he said, stand up, let me show you. And he pretended like he threw a ball, and he said, to hit a curveball, you have to step into it, mm. not lean away from it, which is kind of counterintuitive to what you think you should do. And months later, then that was the third ring for me. What does the story tell us? I should put that in the play. What's that? I should probably put that in the play. <laughs> well, especially because it took me like a year to think about it. I'll, but, I'll um, work that but I think that that larger question of what is this, what does Tony's story tell us about? what does it mean to be human is when life hands you one imperfect chance mm. to live your dream, what do you do? You step into it. Go ahead. Oh, that's beautiful. Yeah, that's beautiful. <laughs> that's beautiful. <laughs> that's just absolutely beautiful. So, so Lydia, you took this frame where we have, we have Tony actually telling her story. Um, what was, um, to me, is there, is there a kind of counter storytelling going on here as well? A kind of reclaiming a narrative about baseball in a way that's adding to the voice and the history of baseball and, and Well that's the kind of thing people say about playwrights, not something playwrights say about themselves. themselves yeah. <laughs> um, I would say that my job, after all of this beautiful foundation that Martha has laid down, is to then put it into a ridiculously short form and make you laugh and cry and um, feel inspired enough to talk about it later. Mm. I want to celebrate, a vo I, the, the reason I was compelled to, to write the play, uh, Pam McKinnon, who really tried and was <laughs> texting me the whole time and had made it all the way to LaGuardia and it just wasn't going to happen, um, called me with Samantha Berry, the, um, the producer of, the, of this, this piece, and they had gotten the rights to this wonderful book. And at this time, I didn't know, at that time I didn't know that Martha was a Radcliffe Fellow. Mm -hmm. But I was going into my fellowship. In fact, I might have just been applying, because I think it was in the application that I was gonna, yeah, Judy, Judy's like, yeah, absolutely it was in the application. Wow. <laughs> um, so there was all of this synchronicity. And, um, and I, I was saying no to commissions. I was a little over commissioned and I'm a slow writer. And so I, when I, as soon as I heard the story, I was sort of, I was, um, it was disappointing that I had never heard of this person before. And um, it felt sort of like my responsibility to, to, which is also, which is sort of as self-aggrandizing as if I'd said the sentence you let in with, but <laughs> <laughs> there it is. So, do you want more? I think that's all. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> that's fantastic. <laughs> Megan, maybe you could add a little, of taking it off the page and giving it this form that you did this evening with the, as, as a director. Um, yeah, sure. I mean, so if, you know, if Martha has like, that lays the historical foundation and Lydia like condenses it into a, a story where we laugh and cry, it's like, we put it into bodies, we embody it, and you have to, like each moment of telling the story, and we, you know, we only got to work on it for four days or whatever, um, and even in that, you know, each moment of it in an embodied way is, is uh, taking that history, all of, the, all of this social, cultural, political, racial, economic history of these people and of this moment, and how they relate to us and our moment, because we're in our moment as we're... In real time. In, mm. Yeah. Um, that every, every second of that is embodied, so... I, I kind of want to... I didn't get a chance to say. Um, these are such talented people. And I know, you, you applauded them, and I know you know they're talented, and they gave a really good performance, but there's a sort of precision and um, a very specific kind of, um, of knowledge and embracing of skill and training that I think the parallel between what an elite group of actors do and what an elite group of athletes do. And so it's been a pleasure to be able to work with people so at the top of their game. And I'm incredibly grateful to the Radcliffe because, I mean, look, 
you, generally when you workshop a play, people don't say, come be in this gorgeous room and we'll put you in this gorgeous hotel and you can eat really good food. They fed us all day. So <laughs> it's a nice way, it's a very cushy way to develop a play and it's um, great that I was able to do it from the birth of this play all the way through. And you gave me another workshop somewhere in the middle mm -hmm. and now to be here and thank you. Thank you, thank you. Okay, I said that. <laughs> <laughs> um, and to Megan. <laughs> uh, I, I mean, I think I was pretty much, you know, that, so talking about embodiment and each, and the way that all of the, all the different layers of what you guys are up to has to be embodied, um, both in the individual body of each actor and in the overall picture of what we're doing. There's something that's so, I mean, you know, you can, you, you, I'm not saying there isn't layers to like a play about a family in a living room, but there's such a, this is the epic scope of this story, both in terms of the, the scope of the game of baseball and in terms of the scope of all of the history that you described and that um, Liz described that it represents is, uh, you know, every image, every, every gesture, everything is really, uh, is, is heavy with all of that. And can I do one more thing like that, that I did? Is to say <laughs> that the elegance of the gestures, I mean, to do a reading is so challenging because you're communicating something that generally, you know, you would see play full out, and that she had these very elegant and precise gestures. You were there, right? So <laughs> I, I thank you for that. That's Good great. directing, thank That's you. Great. <laughs> Nambi, what was it like to actually um, play Tony? Uh, were there, what kind of obstacles did you see for, in your preparation and also for her uh, that she was facing? That's a big question. Um, so I would say in terms of the continuum of what has been laid before me, which is you start with the book and then you break it down into a play and then you break it down into a a director, and then you put it in the body of an actor. For for me, um, the the biggest joy I too did not know who Stone, Tony Stone was. I'm a I grew up a huge baseball fan. Go Cubs! So <laughs> sorry, boo. Uh -huh. So I, I kind of was ashamed that I didn't know who she was, and um, but but equally delighted that wow, you get to discover this wonderful person. And so it was such a, an important part of the history. And so for me, it was like, oh, I gotta find out about it. And then I found out about it. Then I found out about Mamie Johnson and then all the other people that came after her, the woman who replaced her. And, um, and just was just like, like, so part of it was like, yay, this was so much fun. Thank you, Lydia. Thank you, Megan. <laughs> right? But then um, as, we got, as we got into the process, so I did that, I, I read the play. I want to read the book, but I, we didn't have time because this happened so fast, but, but I will. Uh, that for me, it was, I'm, I'm a kind of actor that I, I like to do a lot of research and I like to be very precise and I like to layer stuff in. So for me, like I'm actually kind of disappointed in myself because oh. the, the athlete in me, because I did used to run, that uh, the beauty of, of having a process this process is that we get to share with you a piece of what this is. And literally, that was an edited version of Act One, right? But for the actor, everything that we've talked about is so layered, and it's so complicated, and it's so rich. And so today, what I spent my morning doing, we talked about, Lydia said, oh, she might be on the spectrum, on the autism spectrum. And so I spent my morning watching videos of you know, different people with different levels of autism. And was they, well, they say, well, sometimes he goes, so I'll say, here comes Sidney Pollack, so this is how, you know, so like trying to find that sort of specificity in such a short time is like, Ugh! you know, there's, there's just so much more we could do and layer. And so like, it's, it's, it's a piece of it. And for the actor, it's a piece of it. And so, uh, so as the actor, I can't think about I'm playing history, I just gotta be in the moment. But I certainly layer all of that into it, absolutely. It's so funny to listen to you speak so humbly of the, the truncated process that you had and all that you would do, because I texted, I would text Nambi my uh, appreciation and we te I texted her and I said, I learned so much about the process of writing, watching you be an actor. 
and the, uh, again, back to the precision that I'm talking about, but you can see in the rehearsal room, Nambi layering this and that, and then, and then also Nambi. It's an athletic endeavor to do what you just did. I mean, to carry this thing with all those words. It, anyway, it was so beautifully done, and thank you. Thank you. I, I guess the, the thing is that I, I want to, con I want it to, I'll shut up. <laughs> <laughs> it's just like, just be quiet. I said it already. Well, Nabi, I want, I want to build off what you're saying here a little bit about, about sort of finding these layers and relating that to sports in some way as this very powerful element of society. And I think oftentimes we think of the power of sports, we think of, you know, the NFL, large, large money, big business. But sometimes I think the power of sports in this case is really kind of captured so beautifully by you and Lydia in that first scene when she's touching the ball mm. and she's feeling it. And Lydia's sensuality is sort of, I don't feel like, I feel like it's moving through the piece and it's- Did you say Lydia's sensuality? I, I, I don't know entirely, but I, yes. I, I, <laughs> I, 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 I sense that, I sense there's, a, there's, <laughs> there's um, yes, I do. I, I sense that there's some kind of way in which the sport is actually, you know, she's getting close to the smell of the glove and the crack of the bat. Mm. And it's just so, it's just, you can touch it, you can taste it, and suddenly those desires are part of her, and that becomes part of her relationship with Alberga as we well. We talked about that, we talked mm. about how, and Martha and I talked about that early on too. There's so much that Martha said to me that works its way in, and when I'm sitting next to Martha, I'm like, oh yeah, I got that. Uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> um, about when somebody does something so at the top of their game, there's a sexiness to it. It's, ju it's just hot to see somebody do what they do really, really do well. well. Yeah. And, and it's an interesting thing for the person playing Tony because in, in one way she has this, she, and this is all, this is what I've made Tony. Like I, I, I would not presume to, the Tony that we have created, um, based on the, I just became very inarticulate. What am I trying to say? I don't know. I entirely lost it. It'll come back to me. Absolutely. I well, think what did we start with? I really wanted, I was going to say something really good. The, the I, something really scene. good. Yeah, I feel like it's good. related to the fact that the, what, what, you know, the choices that you've made around Tony, uh, particularly related to, is she on the spectrum? It isn't how you necessarily immediately think of like the oh. most sensual, the most sexy person. That's what I but was. But she is say. sexy when she's really, really ex excels at what she. And does. I was yes. going to say yeah. the challenge for an actor of playing someone who's disconnected from herself, from her body, and from the nuances of how we interact socially, who embodies the sport with to which she is so uh, physically. Tied. Mm -hmm. It's it's really beautiful to watch and beautiful what you did with it. Mm -hmm. That um, the opening scene was the first scene you shared with me here at at, at Radcliffe. It's the first thing we, we were drinking, right? Is the first. <laughs> well, we had that we had that really bad meal down at the. Oh, we yeah, did. Yeah. <laughs> Um, but I had written it on a little thing, and I and yeah. I read it to you. Yeah, you yeah. read you read it to me in in Byerly. and um, I I was just blown away by it because it embodied so much, not only that, that passion of when you do something that you truly love. Mm. I mean, people always ask me, what, what is this book about? And I, I, to a certain extent, it's a love story, but it's a love story about work. It's a love story about what you do. And not only does that passion come out when you're talking about the, you know, the tactile nature of, of the ball and the glove, but it's also identity. And I mean, that, that was completely who Tony was. Um, reporters often ask Tony, what do you like best about playing baseball? And she always had the same answer. And uh, she had this high pitched voice and you could tell there was a sort of quickness to it. Um, I saw footage of her, her eyes would gleam. And she said the most benign kind of mundane thing about the sport. She said infield practice. Hmm. She said, I love infield practice. Well, when you think about it, you know, 
the ball lops first to third, third to second, second to catcher, boom, boom, rhythm, rhythm, rhythm. Mm. So, and then she said this, she said, it's infield practice. She said, it's beautiful, comma, if it's played right. Mm -hmm. You know, so it was also, it was, it was mm. poetry, it was transcendence, uh, it was beauty for her. Wow. You see every time Martha talks, and, and then it's, you have been so generous through the process of, of my writing it because Martha will just be supportive, just supportive. And then you'll say something like you just said, and I'm like, why didn't I put, okay, let me go back. <laughs> and, then, and then people say, wow, Lydia, that was so insightful. And I'm like, yeah. <laughs> Well, the, the, the generosity goes both ways. This is the first time I've ever had a, a book ad adapted for the stage, and I, I didn't know what role I was supposed to play. And I remember we were doing a workshop here at, at uh, Rad Radcliffe a couple years ago. Mm -hmm. And I can't remember the scene anymore, but you turned to me and you asked me about a verb tense. And I was like higher than a kite. I got to, I got to pick the verb tense, you know? <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> That was fun. <laughs> well, I will, I will tell you that there are people who generate the source material who cannot be as generous. <laughs> you could have made this process hell. So I thank you for not doing that. It goes both. Yeah. Uh, we shouldn't end on that. That's yeah. Okay, okay. <laughs> let's not, let's not, let's not. One other aspect we'll that relates to, to this, this notion of regularity and the infield practice is this is this idea that, and it really comes through in Tony's character, about, about her trying to understand the rules mm. of baseball and the rules of dating. And I also, this is, you know, I, I imagine trying to understand the rules that are uh, part of being in Jim Crow, uh, Jim Crow era, right, where breaking those rules are, have really high cost. And um, at some level, I think we can think of sports again as sort of inculcating people who play into a kind of system of justice. Where are these rules? And there's an umpire and there's accountability. And in baseball, there's a special accountability because they're putting all the negative things up on the board about you. <laughs> mm -hmm. And I was just wondering, there's also this, but you're also subverting the rules, right? Mm -hmm. The clowning, right? There's a double consciousness here. If you're watching me, I'm watching you. And you're also doing this in the play, right? You've got the men switching from black to white. You have them. Uh, moving from men to gender as well. Um, can you talk a little bit about the idea of subversion in the, in the clowning and this experience for you? And well, it's interesting. There's an interesting relationship between being an artist of color and, um, and making work that acknowledges, that talks about race and gender and sexuality and how that interacts with an audience. And as my career has progressed and the houses have become bigger and fancier, the audiences have become wider and wider. And so you can't make the work that's about this thing without acknowledging or at least understanding the discomfort of the dynamic and, um, and the tensions between how you're, you're gonna interact with an audience with regards to that you know, and, and it's, a, it's a dance, but I don't think that the dance that African American, that artists of color, that women, that um, women artists of color, that I guess white women, you know, I think anyone who's, oh my God, I'm not saying this very well. I was, I was on a roll, wasn't I? I was, <laughs> I was really doing, doing something. <laughs> but but um, it's a, it's a peculiar dance, and there's such a, a parallel between the dance that these amazing athletes did and um, the dance that we all do to bring what we do to audiences and the politics of that and where the politics meet the art mm -hmm. and how all of that works. And so I couldn't, it just, come, it just comes out of, in, the, in the play. Um, and I don't know that the play, I, I noticed today that I, I think, or I, over the weekend I've noticed that I don't know that the play is quite excavating the joy. Like I don't, I don't know how to put that on stage. The, the, the ridiculous joy of when the win happens and the, you know, I, I, it doesn't right now when I try to put it, 
I don't know how to do it yet. It'll come to me. Um, but that's a part of the dynamic too, the uncomfortable, the dynamic, all of it. Because in the, the minstrelsy, there was joy. And in the, in the African-American audiences watching the clowning, it's a different kind of clowning. It's a different kind of laughter. Mm -hmm. And it's an art form that's appreciated for the art form that it is and becomes something else depending on the hue of the audience and how exactly to capture that for a white audience mm. is, is, is tricky. Mm -hmm. And I mean, that's probably where the joy is lacking in the play, because I don't know how to do that yet. Mm. I guess I could just not let white people come to the play. <laughs> 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 that's one answer. Well, there's, there's one scene that you didn't do today that um, with, with the clowning. Yeah. You know, that just pushes it, pushes it. Pushes well, the, the choreographer found that, and it's such a collaborative uh, piece. The, the choreographer uh, from a workshop that we did in New York found this thing where the, the physical, the actual physical, the exertion. So it started out being this beautiful, funny kind of movement that was dance and light. And through the sheer act of the repetitive nature of it, it became something else, and then it became something tragic. Yeah. And um, it was just, and yeah, so that was, I did, hadn't written, I didn't write that. I wrote the passage that we heard Steve read. Mm -hmm. So it, it's just interesting. But that is, that is where that dance comes. That's the dance. Yeah. yeah. Well, I hope this workshop has given you a, a, ch a chance to really evaluate for yourself, you know, the beauty of the script and the gift that you are giving to people here. And... I, 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 have a, I, have, I, I saw a lot of joy in the cast, and I hope that continues to come through. And uh, maybe this is a good chance now to open up to you all and to see if you have some questions that you'd like to ask. And if you would, we have a microphone here in the center. If you'd come up, please, please feel free to come up, ask a question. Um, we'd really appreciate you if you just identify yourself, uh, who you are, your name, and then just yeah, ask a question and go from there. Hi, my name is Laura, and I was wondering about the choice to make all of the cast other than Tony be played by men in spite of the fact that they go back and forth between multiple genders. You tried to ask me that. You did, you asked me that. That's a good question. Um, I was, if I may, I was hoping to hear about it both from a directing perspective and a playwriting perspective, as well as from the acting perspective, how it informed your performance as well. Great, what was your name, by the way? Laura. Laura. Thank you, Laura. You start, and then I'll go. Okay, I'll start. Thank you for the question. Um, thank you for the question. Um, we, I toyed with if I wanted Tony to be the only woman in the piece, and then part of that whole politic that we talked about, about around the making of theater and the awareness of the politic of the making of theater is that women and African-American women don't actually get to be on the stage enough. So the audacity <laughs> of making one role, you know, for that play that'll happen maybe in February for one actress. But you saw how beautiful that was. Just the act of putting eight male bodies on a stage doing something that is beautiful um, and supporting a woman, an African-American woman, it, it, it felt like it, a really important visual and a really important gesture. And it's fun to be in a rehearsal room with, with eight not unattractive men. <laughs> yeah. um, so there's that. I, I also think that the, uh, so if you had a woman to play Millie and a woman to play Mama, like, they either they aren't on the team or which which to me is just marginalizes them and their bodies further or they're playing men on the team and that to me uh doesn't help us with telling this tony story because tony is on a team of all of all male bodies and t to me there's something like incredibly powerful and as as a woman uh, incredibly powerful to to see her 
to see her struggling, to see her holding her own, to see her going through all the things that she goes through surrounded by these guys. And, um, and so for that reason, it feels right to me. And then I also am moved by watching uh, men uh, play women really respectfully. Uh, we don't see that very often. Usually men playing women is just like, surefire comedy, ha ha, that guy is acting like a woman. That is so funny, right? It's just hilarious. Uh, and, you know, so and in particular, uh, that black men have been asked to put on dresses all the time. And so to have the, the empowering act of having um, an actor be able to embrace the beauty of his mother or his lover and not have that be something perverted is very striking. And, and, and the arbitrary nature of gender. I think it says something really interesting yeah. about gender in general because once she and Millie are in that room, they are two women. And I, and I never think, and I loved that, that Megan casts men with beards yeah. as the women. That was incredible. <laughs> yeah. So satisfying. Yeah, I, I meant that in a good way. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I love what you say about men playing women respectfully. And, and just historically, uh, one of the ways that the Negro Leagues were had to do that dance, you know, through denigration, was that in the 30s, some of the, some of the teams wore grass skirts. Grass skirts. There's a scene that talks about that. Oh, you missed so many good scenes. <laughs> we'll have to come back to the, there's, there's a scene in which the white owners of the teams talk about that. Yeah, they have this right. whole conversation about, is it okay to, make, to, to do something that makes Tony look good on the field? Well, what does it mean to baseball? And yet there are these white owners making the, their, their um, employees do this other kind of dance. Uh, to answer the question about from an acting perspective, uh, for me, there's the moment, where'd she go? There's the moment in rehearsal, hey, sweetheart. There's the moment in rehearsal where I'm like, ha ha, isn't that funny? And then it goes away and I don't even think about it. And it's just the meet, oh, sorry, Mike. It's just the meeting of a soul, souls of spirits on another, you know, so I, it does, I don't even process it. Like the, the reading we did this afternoon and then the reading we did just now, it doesn't, I don't even think those are men. It doesn't even occur to me at all in the scene. And how, how quickly and easily all of my casts have come to embrace that with no control. I thought there would be some kind of thing we would have to do around making the the, the actors feel comfortable in their body, and da, da 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 And immediately, people are game. Actors are, are so game, and, and just, it's really kind of beautiful. Um, thank you very much for the performance and for this panel. It's fantastic. My questions, I, I bought the book uh, last year, Mark, and uh, I was curious from listening to you speak tonight if it would have made a difference when you were doing the interviews if you had been a male, obviously you can't, you know, and if you had been not white. Do you think, because you were talking to a lot of the old players and right. I was wondering hmm. how they interacted with you. Yeah. Well, I was certainly aware as I was writing the book that I was a white writer um, writing about an African American and um, the thing I, I constantly reminded myself of um, was what I didn't know uh, and to be able to um, have a openness to uh, learning everything I could. Um, I don't know that in, that in the interviews that uh, I sense that uh, gender or race would have made a difference. What, um, what I was greeted with again and again and again and again was gratitude for telling a story, that somebody was getting the story out there. Um, I relied a great deal on um, a group called SABER, the Society for American Baseball Research, uh, which is a group of researchers that um, kind of span out to uh, everything dealing with baseball, including one dealing with the, the Negro League. And those guys provided entree for me for all of these um, mm -hmm. 
older players that I talked to. Um, no one ever treated me as though I didn't know what baseball was about, uh, that they had to explain things to me. Um, and uh, I, I hope I entered into those discussions with um, obviously respect and uh, great curiosity for it. Um, so I, I guess my answer to your question is that I, I had a, um, an overwhelmingly positive experience with it. Thank you. So I want to say thanks and ask you all to join me to the panelists, to the actors for this wonderful evening. It's very, it's really a, a privilege um, to get behind the scenes and to see a play in formation. So thank you for being so open and honest with us. And I hope we'll see you all back here tomorrow morning at nine for the conference. Thanks. Thank you.